most of my work is in 19th century <laughs> French history, and both the Veil book and Parité are on 20th and 21st century. And I had done work on, on feminist demands for um, voting rights. Women get the vote in France in 1944. Um, I had done all kinds of, of, of work on, on that. And then I began to read about this movement for parity, Le Mouvement pour la Parité. And that was devised by a group of French feminists who, many of whom were involved in politics and who felt that they were just hitting a, a, a brick wall or a glass ceiling or whatever, that there was just so much toleration by the uh, vast majority of men who were in politics for women coming in. And one of the things they pointed out was that since women had gotten the vote in 1944 until they started the movement in 1990, no more than five, and at most six percent of the French Parliament had 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 were women, and this they seemed to them, this put France on a par with some of the most um, unadvanced um, countries of of Europe and indeed of the world. And this was brought up over and over again as a way of 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 thinking about what to do. Uh, at first, they proposed quotas. Um, and quotas were struck down by the French Constitutional Court as unconstitutional. And then they proposed um, what they called parité. And this was where the thing we talked about before about French universalism was this sort of wonderful turn on French universalism. French universalism, the unit of universalism, is the abstract individual who has no... Um, Characteristics, no social characteristics, no religion, no race, no ethnicity, nothing, except historically sex. Um, the reason women weren't given the vote initially, when w men got the vote, which was in, well, first they had the vote in the French Revolution for a while, but in 1848 you have universal manhood suffrage. Um, women didn't get the vote because they were thought to be domestic, dependent, um, the sex. Uh, they were outside of the political realm. And um, so the, the, the people who supported Parité argued that um, sex was the one thing that couldn't be abstracted um, for the purposes of the abstract uh, individual. And if that was the case, then why not say that the abstract individual came in two sexes, male and female, but that all that that sexual difference meant was anatomy. It was anatomical difference. It had nothing to do with social, cultural, political behavior, capabilities, capacities. Those were all culturally attributed. And so they began to campaign for 50% representation for women. And what they argued was that there should be a law that said that 50% of the parliament had to be all the seats, 50% of the seats in the National Assembly had to be for women, and so on, in all political offices, which didn't fly <laughs> terribly well, although that was the original plan. So this movement developed, and they were, they were ingenious in the kinds of uh, political things they did, the demonstrations they would have, the signs they would, the posters they would hold up, um, all sorts of puns in French on the National Assembly being, you know, all male. And I, I can't really reproduce them in, in, in this. But in any case, they moved along, and as different governments came into they created coalitions also across party lines. This was one of the really ingenious things with women who were leaders in very different political parties. They also um, created a kind of grassroots movement by bringing together the heads of all the sort of voluntary asso the association of graduates, women graduates of technical schools, women lawyers, you know, the kind of professional associations and farmers' wives and whatever, grassroots associations. The leadership of that came together and supported, signed the petition also in favor of Parité. And they created this sort of groundswell of um, public opinion such that at one point, something like, I don't remember the numbers now, but something like 70 or more than 70 percent of the population surveyed, both male and female, thought that there should be greater equality in politics, and they could imagine a woman president of France. Even this was long before Ségolène Royal and you know her attempt to become president. So then the socialists came into power, I think, in 1997, and there seemed a real possibility for getting this law passed because Jospin was um, inclined to do more egalitarian sorts of things, and this seemed like a, a 
a good thing to do. And then the original movement, which was saying on the one hand, there have to be, we have to take sex into account in political representation, but on the other hand saying that sex was irrelevant for the capabilities and the characteristics and the ideologies and the outlooks of, of women and men, that there were, that the differences were, were not um, deeply rooted or biological. Then in 1990, well, in, in, the, in the 90s, but in 1998, 99, it came to a head. This coincided with um, the push for domestic partnership legislation in France. And the domestic partnership legislation un unleashed a campaign that could only be called homophobic, although some of its um, representatives denied that they were homophobic, um, of the most extraordinary sort, in which everybody was okay with the idea that there could be a contract, a domestic partnership contract, but not with the idea that gay couples could have families, that gay couples could adopt or could have access to um, reproductive technologies of all kinds, in vitro fertilization and stuff like that. And the law that passed did not permit adoption or the recognition of a, a um, homoparental family. The debate that unfolded around that was one which reintroduced the notion of sexual difference as a fundamental distinction that had to be maintained. Maybe it wasn't biological, but it was cultural. People said things like, children have a right to know that they are born of a man and a woman. And this in the age of reproductive technology when, you know, some children um, are produced in, in petri dishes and, you know, whatever. Um, that um, children would become psychotic if they were raised by um, same-sex parents, and so on and so on. And um, there was a book published, actually at the time, called La Politique des Sex, The Politics of Sex, by the wife of Jospin, Sylviane Agasinski, a philosopher um, of sorts. And she argued in favor of par parody and against um, homosexual parenting by saying that um, couples, that the, the sort of normal couple had to be a man and a woman because there was complementarity that had to be come into play. And similarly, she said in politics, that complementarity has to be there. So no single-sex legislatures, no single-sex families. And that became the kind of dominant discourse of the moment. And when the law passed, the law on parité, people kept saying, I agree, or many of the legislators who voted for it finally said, yes, I agree with Sylvia Nagasinski that um, there has to be complementarity, that women represent a different sensibility, a different set of concerns, a different set of interests, and we need to have those in the parliament as well. So on the one hand, the law passed, but the underlying premises of it had changed in the course of the history of the movement for parité from one in which um, the goal was to eliminate the notion that there were fundamental differences between men and women and to one in which the fundamental differences were what indeed had to be represented. I think, you know, what, what parité now is, it's a requirement that all the ballots rather than that the legislature has to be half and half, that the ballots, that on most ballots and not all ballots, um, there have to be, women have to be half the, the, the candidates. Um, I'm not sure that would work here. I think it would be dismissed as another form of quota, as a secret form of quota cre creeping in. But I do think that, that the best sorts of situations are one in which sexual difference doesn't matter anymore. And those happen the more um, women because they are the ones who are usually excluded, the more women you have in the group, um, just as the more African Americans you have in a group, the more, the more of others become part of um, what you get used to, 
you stop thinking about the differences of sex or the differences of race. You just deal with them as people, and you disagree with their ideas. You you say no, I don't, you know, I don't like that idea, rather than reacting to them as women or men or uh, black or white or or whatever. I mean, I think those are, in my experience of. Um, having at the beginning of my career being the one woman on the in the Department of History at the university I first taught at to being um, part of, of a group of, when I was at Brown University under uh, a court order Brown increased dramatically increased the numbers of women who were on its faculty after a while you know nobody can say well all women are like her or she's the embodiment of what I hate about women because the variety is, is large enough so that it becomes a kind of irrelevant consideration, or if not irrelevant, because it's never completely irrelevant, a minor consideration in the um, institutional dealings and the practical matters and the kinds of politics and sorts of decisions that you have to make. So I think the more mixing you have, um, the, the, the more democratic and, in fact, the more um, egalitarian things become. Um, again, it's never perfect. I mean, I think there are always going to be deep psychological issues about who's male, who's female, men, women, this, that. But um, those become less and less significant in situations in which you have um, a fairly large representation of the varieties of groups that are that are possible